Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about code health. So let's get into it. So the question in question was, Frederick, from your perspective as a software engineer, at what point should would you say that, uh, should, would you determine that there is too much focus on code health? Well, uh, I think that this is an excellent question because usually the thing that most developers whine and bitch about is that there's legacy code, uh, and to me that's I mean in some cases that is very warranted because sometimes the system is so bad that it's actually painful to not just work with it but also on it and I find that that focus gets to be a little bit w weird sometimes because to me it's sort of like uh, some developers have this uh, the thought it's sort of uh, you know those people who buy a new car or like a new product or like some I mean my girlfriend like a new table and for some reason it is vital that the person or like the that per for this person it is completely impossible to survive without having a pristine state of that thing. It's sort of like, yeah, I can't go out driving today because it sort of might rain and my new car might get some splash on it or some mud on the tires or something like that. And that sort of individual, like that sort of thing, it does actually happen. And th that sort of individual, that type of person is, well, it's not always, but I, I would you go as far as to say that it's almost always just the philosopher programmers who do this. These are the people who truly, truly in their heart believe that things, statements such as we must mo move slower to move faster, we must mob code to get anything useful out of the door, we must do X, A, a B, and C to... Uh, to uh, to do things and the reason why we have all the problems of the universe is because we're not using test-driven development. These sorts of the p people are usually the people who get to the point where they focus on code health to the point where like it's like I, I uh, when I talk with such a person I, I now that I'm so old mature and wise I don't make much of a external show of my utter disgust for people like that but I'm I'm vomiting on the inside if that makes sense and I really am because the the there is as I like I said there's a sweet spot for everything where as I was saying if you buy a new car and if your idea is that the only time that that car is going to be of any use or any value is when it's in a pristine state well then fucking don't buy the car because you're basically going to have to be insane to maintain that state and it's not useful. It's actually the same notion about test coverage um, in you know, when you do unit tests. The sweet spot is usually 80, 80 to 85% coverage. That's roughly it because having 100% test coverage is borderline insane because you would have to actually write in some cases worse code you would have to optimize things to a point where the test coverage is possible to achieve on things that really doesn't matter whether or not you're testing like I don't know the config file are you gonna unit test the config file who's gonna test the t test off the config file mm -hmm. so uh, the time when this usually happens is when, in my opinion, when people come to the table talking about refactors and some stuff like that, and when you ask them, okay, why is this important? And they can't give you a concrete answer to that. Oh, because the code is really messy here. Okay, is there a problem? Do you have um, some type of way of showing that it's a problem or like can you explain like give me a few examples why this matters to us and if they because it usually boils down to the same damn thing they always say there's always a flavor of because it's going to be better that's the thing that they're going to give you it's going to improve our process or something like that and the reality is that unfortunately the uh, more experience or the, the less experienced like managers and stuff like that they don't re can't really hear when somebody's bullshitting you about code health and when somebody's actually genuinely like, when they have a point because as I said it's not like legacy code is desirable but it's as I said you have to determine when you actually have a problem and when you're dealing with an individual who has a mental itch to scratch 
which happens quite a lot. Like uh, I meet uh, developers like that on an almost daily basis, where you know, for for some reason, if it's not done in reactive programming, it's bad code, or and similar things like that. And these are the people that you want to watch out for because they will fuck your project up bad. And when you're focusing, you know that you're focusing too much on code health when you have a disproportionate amount of time spent on code health, in my experience, in my opinion at the very least, versus product development. So the notion that I usually follow when I try to figure out a good balance between code health and like whatever I'm doing is that if you ever get to a point where you're spending more than 50% on fixing code, then you are developing new features. Something is wrong. Something is really wrong. You can absolutely have, like, I mean, I've run teams, and that's usually a very temporary thing. If you're writing the software correctly, working on like fixing things and just you know paying back legacy and stuff like that it should never be if you have such problems that you're actually ha forced to work more on that stuff to, uh, than on the features then in my opinion you're going about it the wrong way there is like I say the 80-20 rule you should have in a state of crisis or where you need very rapid results maybe a 50-50 split because it doesn't take forever. I mean, if you're doing it correctly, it should not take forever to fix legacy code. It's not like it's just growing like fungus or something. It happens when you're doing work. So if you ever get to that point, you, what you should really review is the actual delivery process because the state that you want to be in, it's actually what, the way I've fixed many, like uh, at this point, quite a few uh, code bases when I took over as a tech lead. And it's in my current team as well. Like the, the goal is very simple. You take an inventory of all the stuff that you have and then you figure, okay, all of this needs to be fixed, create a technical roadmap for the stuff that needs to be fixed, and then you say, okay, these are the most important things to do right now, uh, and create a, a breakpoint where basically you set up your process so that from this moment on, no legacy will be produced. Because by just having that, working 50% on product, like, like uh, product development related things, it's actually going to start paying back some of the legacy. You need focus on fixing like concrete stories, like focus on the other 50% that is like critical. You really need to fix this immediately because you you need to really focus on it. But that's, as I said, it's temporary. Over If you're doing this correctly, the amount of time that you're spending on product delivery versus tech debt should go down to, as I said, 80-20 at I mean, in a, I mean, I've <laughs> worked in companies where, or right, we've had. I've worked on systems where we got to a point where the delivery side the process for our product-related features was so well working that we didn't even have to write tests because everything was completely standard. It was actually mo uh, some of the developers started joking that it was boring to work because nothing ever broke. And you can achieve that for certain systems in certain cases. I'm not saying that that's always going to be possible, but it is possible. So like, that's at least how I solve this problem. And as I said, usually the, the you know that you're focusing too much on cold health when paying back legacy debt is, it has more investment than actual value. Like you're rather like building features, the thing that the whole, I mean, you're, if you're spending more time on just fixing code than you are shipping shit, then you are focusing on the wrong thing or you have a very weird uh, legacy depth uh, situation. So what I want you to take away from this is that from my perspective, uh, you can determine that you're focusing too much on code health when you're dealing with people who are zealot, philosophers, people who should not be in a decision-making situation whatsoever they're super annoying and these are the so because they, they are the equivalent of uh, a person whose idea of solving uh, the world's problem uh, and getting world peace is to have a concert sure the I thought is nice but it's not gonna make a damn lick of difference uh, in the real world these people are usually very dangerous and they usually get you to this state where they focus on processes to the point where you're actually not getting anything you're just slowing down and I'm sorry to say that I've worked with people like this and they're super annoying they're so annoying because they're well-meaning stupid people 
if you have a good strategy for code, health and legacy and like things like that, it should at most be 50-50. And I've only had to have 50-50 when I've been handed a third part, like a second generation code base that was in such a state that it was embarrassing and we needed that thing to get to an enterprise level within a few months. At that stage, the only sane thing to do is to split it 50-50. But once again, when you do that split, you have to actually have to check. And that's when experience really helps you. You have to look at, okay, these are the critical things that are the core features of the system and they're really, really bad. Okay, we need to just focus on those first and refactor those. So that's 50% of the thing that we're focusing on. That's very important. But the most important thing is to create that, that line in the sand where you say, all right, I will now set up a process that guarantees that when we spend the other 50% on feature delivery, that all those features are going to automatically be at, a, at, the, at the level of uh, quality that we are expecting. And that's where the Boy Scouting rule comes in. I love the Boy Scouting rule because if you follow that practice, if you create like test coverage and like checks and so forth to make sure that the developers are now actually doing their job well, well, then you're guaranteed that two things. Usually then like this product source, they will be take a little bit longer in the beginning because probably there are no tests or like there are no, you know, there might be issues and so forth. But uh, as you deliver more and more features, you will actually start helping out the 50% you're spending on legacy and very quickly get to a state where you can go to 80-20. That's a good number because if you're ever spending more time on process or f paying depth than you are shipping shit, then then you are, by my definition, focusing too much on code health. Have a great day.